This is Catalog and Cocktails. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcast. Here's your hosts, Juan Cicada and Tim Gasper. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Catalog and Cocktails. This is your weekly live hangout, an honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty beverages in hand. I'm Tim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, joined by Juan. Hi, Tim. I'm Juan Cicada. I'm the principal scientist at Data.World. And as always, great to take a break here in the middle of the week and chat about data. And today we're joined by Pat Berry. Pat Berry is a VP of, of SPM Marketing, if I get that right. How are you doing, Pat? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Well, we're, we're need doing a drink. Great. <laughs> it's Wednesday, and Wednesday is always a good time for that. It is. Middle Definitely. of the I've got Friday and Monday off. I took Friday and Monday off to elongate that Easter weekend. So uh, Ooh, nice. today is my Thursday. Um, I'm excited. So what are we uh, drinking for today, and what are we uh, toasting for? So today I have got a Lagunitas uh, daytime IPA, uh, a little bit lower alcohol. As we get into the topic, you'll find out I have to do some more work after this tonight. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, toasting today, I know uh, my kids, I'm toasting to Easter. Uh, my kids are really excited for Easter. Uh, we got a nice little Easter egg hunt planned for Sunday morning. So uh, here's the Easter weekend. That's what I'm toasting to. Awesome. Awesome. How about you, Tim? Cheers to that. I am drinking a um, tequila with uh, some red grapefruit in it. Mm-hmm. Kind of, I don't know, salty dog style or Paloma style, whatever you want to say, right? And uh, Cheers. I'm going to cheers to, um, I've been actually running a lot more lately and I'm going to do a a, a 5k this Sunday just by myself, see what time I get. So I'm very excited about that. Well, I have uh, some rum and I'm, I've been happy just mixing rum with some bitters and kind of trying that out with some soda. So here's a nice Panamanian rum, rum abuelo with some orange bitters. And here we go. Oh, cheers. cheers. All cheers. All right. Well, we got a, our, our warm-up question of the day. Uh, what things do we wish we would self-destruct? And uh, my answer to that is this freaking coronavirus, COVID. Can you please just leave to self-destruct? Uh, I'm into that. Let's, let's, uh, I will drink to that, and I will salute that as well. Yeah, I was going to say, there's nothing else I'd rather see go away than the pandemic. Uh, so I'll throw yeah. that. That sounds awesome. Um, hope this thing blows up soon. But in a nice, peaceful manner that doesn't hurt anyone. Just let it go. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're all pacifists here. We don't, we don't really want things to self-destruct too much, right? Uh, only the really bad oh. things. Exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, the reason for that question was the mission impossible, impossible, impossible about starting your data team. So let's just kick it off. I like to kick us off, to kick us off with this honest, no BS question. And even though today's topic is about starting the data team from scratch, um, Pat, you yeah. are in a really interesting situation because you are in a, real, a new role here where you are actually starting a new data team. Um, so this is the topic of today, but honest, no BS. Do you really start a team from scratch or, or there's actually something there that you actually have to work from? So it, it's funny because, you know, I went through the interview process. I knew several people that worked at SPM um, and they kept saying, like, listen, we don't have anything. Like, we need you to come in and start like right from the base. And I'm like, all right, no, that's fine. Thanks for being honest. I appreciate it. So, you know, naturally I get in and I'm like, oh, so you guys actually have like some web analytics, you know, Google Data Studio. You've got your marketing data in there. I'm like, this is something. So I was more I was I was pleasantly surprised. I'm like, good. You guys actually know what you're doing. Um, it became more of one, what type of staff do we need to suit the client's needs? What should we need to build? Um, and then kind of go from there. So I guess from, from a people standpoint, there was no one officially in data and analytics, but they did, they have a really, really good media team, uh, that understands SEM, uh, display programmatic traditional media, and they had a pretty robust, uh, reporting system. So coming in, I really can't say it was like starting from scratch. That's what I thought. Um, and I'm glad it wasn't, it's always good to come in, but yeah, honestly, before I started, all I could think was like, all right, I'm going to have to explain to him what Google analytics is and what Google data studio is. And I'm thinking like, these are You're kind of like things. truly from scratch. You were worried, right? <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm not worried. They were just honest. I'm like, okay, this is what they told me. And I'm like, okay. So, 
you know, I've, I've kind of, I've done this, not quite to this level before, but I have come into other organizations and had to start up like some sort of a data practice. And it's usually been like, all right, you guys have one, your data flow is all messed up. We need to automate, we need to do this, that, and the other thing. Whereas this was more like start off with like, hey, how can we make our media reporting more effective? And then what else do we need to do from there to like round out what our clients really need? So again, like I, it was more like a happy thing. Like I came in, I'm like, oh, no, man, you got the, the cake's been made. It's been baking. I just, we need to put some frosting on this a little bit. And then, you know, what sort of toppings can we add to that cake to make it even sweeter and better for our clients? Um, well, let, let's continue this analogy. So what are the ingredients that we need to go start to start up a data team? So, I mean, I always like, we got people, processes, and technology, right? But let's go kind of go through each one of them and um, I'll, well, I'll kick it, you'll kick it off, Pat. I'd say, honestly, before you even get to the ingredients, it's like, what's the recipe? because I didn't want to- Fair complete. point. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, we might need like, I, you know, it, understanding clients a little bit, they're all, they're hospitals and clinics. So I was like, okay, that much I, I did know coming in, but in terms of level of sophistication, like where they're at in their data maturity model, I don't, I don't know. So I think it became like, I, tr I didn't want to come in thinking like, this is exactly what I want to do. This is exactly what these people are going to need. So instead of coming up with, you know, what elements do you need? Well, one, let's, let's make the recipe. And to me, that starts with one, know, get to know everybody internally, build the relationships internally, see how they're working, what their workflows processes are like. You know, if you come in and you're like, you're just gonna start kicking down doors, you're probably gonna piss people off. And like, nobody wants somebody to come in and say like, oh, you're doing this all wrong, which they, they weren't at all, but that's, I wanted to avoid that. Like, don't go in and immediately start criticizing. Uh, a little bit of a side note, the other thing I learned too, Starting a new job in the pandemic, oh my goodness, it takes probably two to three times as long just to get to know people because there's no like, let's go to lunch or would you like to grab a coffee or just a simple conversation walking down the hall. There's, there's, yeah, none there's, there's none a lot less, uh, lot less running into folks and being like, oh, hey, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. It's like uh, everything on your calendar is a one-on-one -on -one that you explicitly put on there, right? <laughs> that's, yep, that's, that's pretty much it. And even like some of those two, you know, we'd schedule something and be like, hey, let's talk about your, your client list. And then we'd end up just shooting the shit between the two of us and like just getting to know each other. Um, so it definitely, it took a little bit longer, but, you know, understand internal workflows and processes and just kind of observe, like I was given a pretty good runway to say like, you know, yes, we need you to sell some services eventually, but take some time, understand what's going on, um, internally, and then get introduced to the client. Um, a lot of what I found too, is just, you know, from what the internal teams would tell me extremely accurate, but then you go to talk to the client, they're kind of telling you the same thing. And just by starting to ask them certain questions about their business or something else, another nugget of information would come out. I'd be like, oh, shoot, I wonder if we knew that or we didn't. Um, and it would augment what I would think we should be able to, to do for that particular client. So before even like getting the ingredients and skill sets that we need, it was important just to understand like, you know, what are they doing internally now? What do the clients need? Because if there's certain things the clients just don't need, um, for example, a lot of our clients are, are regional, again, hospitals and clinics. So I used to manage a social listening team. Social listening can be fantastic if you're a big national brand in, in a certain space, but something for like our clients, like I don't think too many people are going to be talking about hospitals and clinics, maybe outside of vaccines in your local, local social listening region. So Maybe someday we'll offer that, but right now it just doesn't make any sense. Like I don't think it'd be very valuable or worthwhile for any of our clients. Um, yeah. yeah, this goes back to what we always talk about on understand who's actually consuming the data and, and what they're going to go do with that. And at the end of the day, those consumers of the data, they're the ones who are going to define what success looks for you. Uh, and so understand their needs because at the end of the day, they're the ones who tell you this is what I want or not. So. I think that's super crucial to think about it. What are the client's needs? I really like you're saying client's needs and don't just walk in and kick down doors and start criticizing. It's like observe. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, we want to have this baseline. Where are we right now yeah. to understand, okay, we can improve this and we have a way to compare and to say, hey, we are actually improving. We are actually, we can quantify our improvement and, 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 and quantify what success looks like. Exactly. You know, it's not, it, it, it's, it, that's probably been the other hard thing too, is because you start talking to some of these clients and they're, you know, you can kind of tell they're throwing out the big buzzwords like, hey, how can we use machine learning? And I'm like, well, we can, but let's get, you know, you're just kind of your basic monthly reporting down. 
because you don't you don't have that. And we need you know you need to understand you know kind of your basics first before we start talking about regression or advanced modeling or anything like that. Um, and, and some of the other challenges because they're a little bit smaller regional hospitals, you know their their budgets are they're a little bit different than what I've been used to dealing with. So. A lot of them, you know, they'll ask like, oh, you know, I'd love to understand more about multi-channel attribution. And I'm like, hey, great. You know, it's a great tool. Uh, I've done that before, um, but, you know, it's very complicated. And here's, you know, kind of just top of mind, like initial price tag, or, you, know, you know, the eyes turn into dinner plates. And it's like, oh my God, that's like, that's like a fourth of our marketing budget for the whole year. And I'm like, this, this is hard technical stuff. So that's why you, you don't want to, you know, get them up too fast you know, to something that's just they either can't afford or isn't necessary. Um, but get them to know, like, there's a lot you can do just with your first party data and what you have. So start to mine what they have and tailor something for that specific client. You know, it's not like it, it, our, our world is not just open a can and I can use the same process, you know, for every client, maybe at a high level, you know, when you're thinking about how to implement, you know, an A-B test, for example. But from what client A needs to what client B needs, it might be two very different things. So you can't necessarily come in with like this catch-all diagnosis for data for every single client. Yeah, it, it, depending on where you're going, uh, you know, to go with that analogy of cooking or whatever, right? The kitchen's different. The people that are helping you are different. The, you know, the, the tools you're working with are different. And you have to be okay with navigating that unique situation, right? Um, yeah. and, and maybe to look at it from... Uh, and maybe to look at it from the scenario of like Mission Impossible, right? Not every mission is shaped the same, right? Uh, to bring us back to our original theme, right? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, in two point two, like the, the kitchen's different, the tools are different. Um, some clients, they have a sous chef, you know, they have somebody that's actually doing data analytics internally, but they're over one, it's like one person, you know, trying to do data analytics for, you know, this, uh, like a good size organization. They're more looking for consultation advice, like, can you just come in on this project and help me out? Yes, absolutely. Like I thought to do it this way, that way. So um, you, know, you really, it, you, you do have to come up with kind of a game plan, you know, at, at the whole as to how you're going to do things and implement certain things. But when it come, gets to that client level, to me, it's got to be very specialized for that client. You know, it's just, they're all different. Um, they all have different ways of working. So, um, and you, you make that point. Yeah. Is we need to think through this for you. You know, we, how we do this with this client is very different. So um, making sure they're understanding that that level of detail that they're getting is going all into their, into their business. It's not like we're taking the same thing, you know, creating a template and then rolling it out. So I'm sure for certain things, maybe a dashboard or something like that. Yes. Right. But, um, ROI calculations. Right, right, right. And, and you're trying to move them up that maturity curve in the right way. Right. Um, so when you actually kind of assess the situation and you kind of are getting your feel, you're, you're starting to figure out how to work with different folks. Um, how do you actually go about crafting that, that plan, right? Like, uh, like how, how did you decide, oh, I'm going to hire these people first. These are the first goals I'm going to put in place. Like how, what was your kind of thought process as you go through that kind of thing? Well, I think as you start to see some of the base offerings that again, that we already had in place, it was like, okay, like just looking at skill sets, like what skill sets do I need? Um, so we actually have a, a senior analyst uh, moving over to the analytics team tomorrow. Um, she was on the existing media team super bright, knows the entire Google marketing stack, like the back of her hand. Um, and frankly, that was when I saw all of our clients using the entire Google marketing stack, I was like, all right, well, probably get somebody that's really good with that whole stack. Um, and she's got a tremendous media background. So somebody that I was lucky she was there internally because she knows the clients already. She knows the systems, how they're set up. Um, so I think having somebody with that web analytics, optimize, um, and her media knowledge with uh, Google ads campaign manager, that was something right out of the gate. I was like, all right, I need somebody with that. And I was very lucky that she was there internally because she was like, yeah, this sounds like a good move. Um, and then really from there, it's, you know, I think as we move into, especially into a cookie world, we're, we're going to need somebody that knows, you know, business analytics, probability modeling. You know, I'd call it, I'd love to get a real data scientist in, but again, trying to control costs and make sure we can get what we need. So looking for somebody that can come in, um, you know, work within a, a data warehouse and data transfers, has great SQL skills to help with ETL processes. Um, and then especially that, that predictive modeling. And I mean, like, even if it's somebody that can come in and just do, you know, basic regression, linear regression in Excel sweet like we need to do something like just to just to fill that gap because i know we're going to need that knowledge moving forward so that was kind of the the second 
identifier there is just like, all right, moving forward, we will need this just for efficiencies and the, the way I see the entire business going. Um, and then I guess my, my third kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it a curveball, but um, I'm also trying to staff for our, our SEO as well. So I started my career in SEO a while ago, like 15 years ago. Um, did that for five or six years. And then I moved into much more hardcore data and analytics stuff that we do today, web analytics, modeling, all that type of stuff. Um, so I've got a nice eight year gap in my SEO knowledge, but uh, I've had to re-up that. So trying to staff for SEO specifically um, has been something that's something that we're trying to get into as well. So really those were the areas and it was really based on, on demand. Uh, the SEO piece was they had somebody, he had left right when I started the clients are big into it um, and they wanted to start to understand like, all right, like, is this viable? And I'm like, yeah, we can, we can project good revenue. We just, I need somebody here to have that, do that SEO all by themselves. And that leads. But, so you, you said a couple things, a few things, and, and two of them were what I ex kind of expected. Like we want folks who are kind of more on the data engineering side, who could, could work on SQL transformations, the data warehouses, and then on the data science side, but Hey, it doesn't have to be so sophisticated. Like, Know your regressions, we can do stuff in Excel. But I like what you already got to is folks who actually know the tech stack for the particular domain. So if you're working in marketing and you have to deal with Google Analytics, LinkedIn ads and stuff like that, like those are good. If you have expertise in that, that's really going to help you go forward very quickly. So, and, and that may be a data engineer, that may be a data scientist, or maybe that's just somebody else who's not a data data scientist is actually so people who actually know that particular domain i think and this goes back into a lot of the conversations we've had before is wait who should own the data should it be the folks that that in that domain if you're in the marketing world well you need to have some domain expertise from the marketing world that's different from somebody else on the sales side different from some of the shipping side and so forth right there's different tools and different applications people are going to be using Exactly. And, you know, honestly, like if I came in and all the clients were in the Adobe stack, you know, okay, if we, if we had somebody internally that was really good with that Adobe stack, I probably would have looked at them as well. But again, those, it's two very different systems, how they're set up, how they operate. Um, and so that it just more like it was one of those, those common identifiers, you know, we looked to combine data with a, a key or a commonality. That was the one for me was the Google marketing platform. I'm like, oh, every single client's using it we better get somebody that's really good with GA G, and now GA4, GTM, um, we're running A-B testing like Optimize. I wanna start doing surveys. So people that understand that entire Google stack, um, it just became that, that commonality. I was like, eh, we better you know, find somebody that's, that's there and knows that, that type of stuff. And how about, let's, you're talking a lot of like tools like Adobe and, and, and Google for analytics and stuff, but kind of from more general perspective on what are, what's the baseline, the minimal tools that, what needs to be in your toolbox to, when you're starting your data analytics team? I mean, you know, I, I, I would say that even varies too, because I, you're going to need a, probably a, a BI tool of some sort. I mean, a business intelligence, data visualization tool, a dashboarding system, whether it's Google Data Studio, it's free, but that's only gonna hold so much. So, you know, what else is out there that uh, is affordable that'll actually process the, the, the data that you need? Um, from there, it's what, what tools, you know, I guess, especially as you start to hire, what tools do the people that are working for me wanna use, you know? Um, should I really force like R on my new senior analyst? If she wants to use it, sure she might be more comfortable doing things in Excel. So in terms of analyzing the data and getting to it, I would tend to kind of err on like, all right, like what, what makes you the, the absolute most comfortable? Um, to have things in place, I mean, you're always gonna wanna have web analytics in place, but those are technically owned by the client. So I can't say I would just show up and immediately say like, hey, you need Google Analytics. Um, but look at like, look, what, look, look at what the tech stack that the clients are using and then again, like base your, your tool sets on, on that, what they're using, but then also the skill sets and the preferences of the team that you want to hire. Now, you know, for somebody like a data scientist, I would think, all right, you're Python R, um, you know, a data engineer, I definitely want it's some sort of data warehousing capability experience with a particular platform, whether that's Snowflake, BigQuery, uh, Azure, whatever it is. Um, but then kind of augment your tool sets based on what your team feels is most efficient. Cause even I still, I can, you know, I can still do like VBA coding in Excel, but I feel like old, old man when I bring that up with like newer people. Cause they're like, why would you, why, why do you do that? And I'm like, well, it's just, 
I like that. That's what I'm fucking used to, you know? <laughs> what do you want me to say? Like, I know R pretty well, but sometimes I just want to pop open Excel. <laughs> I'll just do it in there because it's, it's, it's what I'm comfortable with. Um, so even that too, you know, you want to have those certain, you know, tool stacks in place, but you, you got to be flexible. You know, not everybody wants to work in a certain platform. So I always just ask, like, what do you think is best? Um, and then again, like constantly be changing. I mean, there's God, how many tools out there to use these days. And so what's newest, what's, what's tech and cutting edge. And then also what's in the budget, you know, what can we actually afford? Yeah. A lot to think about here. Lots of balance on the people, on their skill sets, on their budget, which is another thing, right? We, we, everybody's throwing around all these tools we want to go use and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, like we got finite amount of resources, people and money. And, and sometimes you don't, and, and things may be free, but it's free like puppies, like people like to say, not, not free like beer. So you got to be careful about it, right? <laughs> well, and, well, and that's one of the things too. There's free tools out there. And so they're great. Like, don't get me wrong, but they're, they're, they're free for a reason. They're, they're going to have certain limits. And so when you stop using that free tool and say, hey, we've got enough revenue coming in, we can go afford this, this upgrade from that. Um, so it's all this combination of, you know, honestly, like how much, excuse me, you know, revenue we bring it in. What's the team comfortable with? What's best for the client? Um, once that's all together, then I just put in a big, big bowl, mix it all together, microwave it for a couple of minutes, and then we're all good. You know, we're done. Uh, no, it's it's. Uh, it's I love uh, that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And and hey, you know, Pat, how do you how do you know when you've achieved success? Like, how how do you know when you're achieving what you set out to as part of the organization and as part of what you're trying to do with your teams, your team's goals? I mean, honestly, bottom line is when we start bringing revenue for data and analytics. I mean, that's that's the easiest one. We've created buying. Yes, that's money. it. It's all about money. <laughs> you're making money or you're saving money. That's the ultimate <laughs> KPI. Like it, the cap, it's like, it has to be that simple, period. Yeah. I mean, that, that's all it, it, it is what it is, too. You know, it's just, I, I'm, I'm here to drive it. It's a business. You know, I'm here mm -hmm. to drive revenue and build this team. That's ultimately what we're here to do. But, I would say too, like, you know, am I improving my clients' businesses? Are we putting ideas in front of them that they're like, oh, you know, we never thought to, to do that? Or is there a new process that we can put in place or a new optimization with our media team that helps, uh, you know, uh, uh, them spend the marketing dollars more efficiently? You know, and again, like, it's all those things you would do with a client that would ultimately lead to them saying like, yes, I want to do more business with, with all of you guys, you know, every single person at SPM. Um, and we also have a sister company called Center Tech as well, where I do quite a, you know, all of their data and analytics work. They're a, a web redesign firm, um, but kind of, you know, bringing everything together, you know, and starting to say like, okay, like it, it really is revenue, but if you're putting a smile on the client's face and the client's happy, I would say that's a measure of success. And usually the revenue pretty closely follows that, that happiness, unless I've been living in an alternate universe for the last you know, 15 years. But, uh, it's generally, generally yeah. If, if if the client is making money, they're going to be happy and they're going to keep working with you because. Yeah. Hey, so that, I, one of the things I want to touch is do's and don'ts. What are the we've talked a lot about the do's, like we should do this and this. What are the things that we should not do? I you know don't well don't come in making assumptions. I'd say listen. So don't don't be a loud mouth. Sit back and listen. You know it's that's the most important thing. Um, and I think too, is, you know, don't, don't ever underestimate, you know, a client's knowledge of data or what goes on with a certain part of it. You know, you're always going to be proposing new things, talking about new techniques, um, talk to them like you would, you know, don't dumb it down so much where they're like, wow, I actually know what that is. You don't have to talk to me like an idiot. Um, but also try to understand, you know, from their perspective, maybe they're, they're part of the country, especially since I'm dealing with hospitals and clinics with all the vaccine stuff. You know, how you might talk to somebody in the East Coast might be a little bit different than somebody how you speak to them in, in the South, just based on their that day's situation with the vaccine. Um, so don't ever assume that, you know, just because they're working at a hospital, they're going through the same thing um, that somebody in New York is as somebody in Florida. Um, so don't make assumptions. Try to be friends with everybody. You know, that's really, I guess that'd be more of a do. Uh, don't, I, I'll just be blunt, don't be an asshole. Uh, be open-minded, like just don't be a jerk, you know, like that's, that's the best thing to do is just treat people with, with respect. I think that, that, that that's great life advice. Just don't be a Honest. jerk. Cool. 
I mean, that's, that's one of my, my biggest things in life, just life advice in general. Just, I try to avoid assholes. I try not to be one, you know, it's just one of those things. You're going to run into them. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. Uh, but I think it's the frequency, which, which, which I encounter assholes that I just try to like monitor and keep track of. Uh, there's a- I, I love this. This is like, this is truly the most honest, no BS thing. Like how, what should you do? What don't, just don't be an asshole. Yeah, like, I mean, really. It's, 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 it's that simple, but it, just be it, a nice it, person. <laughs> do be a nice person don't don't be an <laughs> yeah but it's true like you you encounter all these pe- you encounter people you don't want to like uh, people who hoard knowledge and they want to go share it because they're like that this is my job and i don't want to give it away all this knowledge that i have right and and don't be that person no i think you know especially within data and analytics like you, you need more of a community feeling because i'm i'm not you know i have expertise in certain areas within data um, but I would never sit here and pretend to be a data engineer or a data scientist. I get found out like that. I'm sure I can talk a good game. I understand some of the processes, but, you know, honesty, being transparent, you know, that, that all comes through when you're talking to clients and just, just tell them again, like, you know, be honest with them, but don't be a jerk about it. You know, I think that's. Yeah. So how do you deal with kind of, or just, I don't know if any, any experiences you want to share about just dealing with folks like that? Because I think we've all encountered like, uh, yeah, you, you're you going in that there's somebody who really knows a lot about the data, but they're just not the best person to go work with, but they are they just have so much knowledge about how things are working. Like, as you say, we're going to go observe the, ex- the existing workflow, the existing environment, and they're, they're, they prov- they're part of the friction in a way. Like, how do you, I mean, I don't know, any, any interesting stories there to go tell? Nothing. I've always been able to, I've run into a couple people like that, but then I don't know. I'm, I have a smile painted on my face most of the time. So I always feel like oh, my niceness can kind of break it down. But, you know, sometimes you just, you got to pry that out of people and just get them to understand, like, listen, you know, you are valuable. We need you to spread that knowledge out um, and let people know, you know, we'll give you credit for obviously for, for helping us and spreading that knowledge, but you've got to spread it so that everybody can benefit from, from what you know. Um, it's not the easiest thing in the world. And I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of egos in this business. It's just how it is. But I think once you, you know, be a genuine person, again, like don't, don't be an asshole, just put out there what you know, what you're good at, what you're knowledgeable of. And I think, you know, people open up a little bit and start to follow you. Um, there's going to be, again, this, it's more back to the asshole thing. There's going to be closed off people like that, that just like, I need to keep everything in here, you know? And like, I guess I've been fortunate to never work in an organization where, um, the, the data teams weren't set up as a community type feel where you could go ask somebody who has a specialty, a question that have no problem answering, you know, within the boundaries of their work day, but um, where they could go ask a question. So I don't have any real life experiences to, to, to point to. I've been fortunate enough to not have really have to dealt with anything like that, um, where it's like the person literally will not like stop being an asshole, like the ultimate asshole, like they're just constantly that. Um, so I think it's important to foster that, that type of community. And some of them going back to with this, you know, with building a team is like, we need those different skill sets. And what I tell everybody on the team, you know, that I'm working with or like trying to hire or even our new person that's coming in is like, you know, you're an expert in this area, but know that when we get these other skill sets in, there's going to be cross learning. I mean, whether it's forced or natural, you'll just naturally start to learn other things. And that helps foster that, that, Hey, I can chip in here. I don't have to worry about so-and-so taking this nugget of knowledge and running with the client with it and them getting all the credit, you know, truly like team atmosphere. Right, right, right. Sharing knowledge, skills, you know, constantly. I mean, our world changes every single day. It's not like this is, you know, what I knew 10 years ago is exactly the same as it is today. It's quite the opposite. It's very, very different. Um, so again, just trying to foster yeah. that you know, transparency, openness, like those types of things. Yeah, I mean that sounds so critical to to be balancing all those things. And and your comment about having lots of different skill sets and, and and thinking about the people, obviously that's a key theme here. Makes me think about uh, I know uh, in some of our conversations leading up today we had talked about sort of diversity, right? And there's diversity of skill sets, but then there's diversity of viewpoints, diversity of just like straight up, you know, diversity of background, right? Like how how does that play into how you think about growing your team and and managing sort of the expectations of your team? Well, it it definitely does. I mean, you're going to need people with very specific skill sets to come in and do that specific task, job analysis, whatever it is. But yeah, I mean, the more well-versed somebody is and the more, I mean, you're talking to a guy who started in SEO and then moved very quickly into, you know, regression modeling. 
which yeah, there was a learning curve for me. It's not like I just did that overnight. Um, so I think the, the more background you have and the more knowledge and areas you can share, that's always going to be beneficial. Um, and frankly, I encourage that. Like, I don't want somebody to just sit in a corner and wait till your topic comes up. Like, if you have a question or, hey, you remembered you worked on a project in this different type of discipline like eight years ago, tell, tell me about it. Like, what did you learn? What did you see? Like, what's going on? So it's, it's again, like, draw those skills out. You know, one of the... One of the as the team gets bigger, you know, one of the things I always do is, uh, is is presentation skills training. You know, in our world, some people aren't as well spoken as others, so we want to get up and start to you know at least practice, like talk to people. You know, you might be the most brilliant data scientist in the world, you can't spit out what you're, what's what's up here. We're not, we might not get too far. So yeah. just doing that type of stuff and encouraging people, like creating a safe environment where people know that they're not gonna like. No one's going to make fun of you if you mumble a word out. No one's going to make fun of you if you're not on the ball with this exact specific topic that's not really in your wheelhouse. Well, that's okay. Like we have other people here that are good at that. We'll help you learn and build that up. Um, you know, I don't operate in silos. You just, you, you can't, like you'll never get anywhere. Um, so again, it's important to create that, that open environment with your team. I think that'll show with your clients too. You know, clients can tell when they get on the phone with you how well the people in your organization get to know. Yeah. Along. They know uh, yeah. if your if your company is having issues that that filters into their experience, right? Oh yeah, man. I mean, we had a couple of initial calls with clients that you know we were on on the Zoom early, all you know, laughing, joking around, talking about the weekend. I'll never forget it. it was a client. They dialed in. They didn't say a word. We didn't even realize they were on the phone. We're like, oh, hey, this is Matt, and we're like, oh hey, hey Matt, what's going on? He's like, geez, I I thought I was in like a friend call by accident. You guys are just so friendly. Again. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, we all love working here. So, and it was, it was great. You know, they were, that relationship's going very well to say the least, but um, you know, it, it bleeds out. You know, I think attitudes are infectious and the more you can bring people together, let them know that, Hey, it's a safe spot. You can work together. I got you back. You know, it'll open up everything for you. So there is a lot. I, of I, I love that. Create a safe environment. Attitude is infectious. I got you back. Yeah, oh, man. Well, that's just but, how I roll, dude. You know? yeah. <laughs> that's how it no, is. So, so I mean, we're, we're, again, time flies, time flies. But there's one other thing I wanted to chat about was on centralization versus decentralization of teams, right? So I, I, I can imagine if you're a small organization, you can have a centralized data analytics team. But once organizations get bigger, is like, can you, should you, or not have a centralized, or how do you balance a centralization, decentralization it's a great question. And I think some of the two are so relevant with the pandemic because we're still working from home. Um, I kind of look at like, all right, what skill set am I looking for? And really based on that. Um, if that person, I, I'm based in the Chicago suburbs, um, obviously you know, right near Chicago. So we've got a good pool of talent, but I also don't want to limit myself to that because if there's somebody that works in, you know, Las Vegas or, you know, Oregon or Vermont, wherever, and they have the exact skill sets that I'm looking for, plus some more, that's fine. Um, I think, I think with our type of work too, it's, it's, it's a little bit more suited to kind of the remote, you know, yes, it'd be great if I had everybody in person, but I'm not going to pitch this whole. Oh, but what are your thoughts about actually having like data teams that are in a centralized data? There's a, a data analytics team for the company, or there's a data analytics team per department or per domain. How do you, I mean, do you have any particular preference on that side? Oh, no, sorry. I misunderstood the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no. that was still valid. It was a strictly great what you said before. No, I think, you know, we, we do like to stay centralized and then treat it as like, as the issue comes up, who's best suited to handle that exact task. So, so you're talking about decentralization with like, I have somebody that sits on the media team. I have somebody that sits on the strategy team. And they're like, yeah, because we're, we're seeing this a lot, I think. And also this, the, the very popular, this paradigm shift on the data mesh, which is all thinking about data products and having the data domains and stuff like that. So it's, well, if I'm the expert or, or the marketing team, they know the marketing data, they know the marketing tools, let them own that data. And they have like their own, and they'll provide analytics. So they, they'll, they'll run that team about marketing. Somebody else on another domain, like they know that domain very well. Well, if you just have one centralized team for the entire organization, like they don't know the marketing data very well, right? So you have to have, so there's a balance at the end because then there's a lot there. You want to avoid having uh, to reinvent a lot of the wheels, right? Totally, totally. I yeah, if you if you over distribute, there can be challenges there, right? So yeah, curious as your thoughts. 
So honestly, like right now, it, it, that end of it hasn't really crossed my mind because it's a smaller company. Um, while the analyst I brought, the, she's going to be a senior analyst, but she was from their media team. So while she's working with me, she really, and there's other non-media products she's been working on, but she will still be very close contact with that media team. So she's understanding their optimizations they made for SEM campaigns and then can work with them to help explain the data, uh, make sure it's clean, you know, build it up. So I guess in that sense, we, we'll still, we'll stay somewhat centralized, but I could see us decentralizing over the next couple of years. I think it just depends on, on the growth of the company. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> and the growth of the team. A uh, little, little extra there, sorry. I guess you really enjoyed that beer, huh? <laughs> Those daytime APA, IPAs go down fast. So, yeah. Hey, well, hey, I told you 30 minutes fly by. This is this has been a great conversation and uh, we always like to wrap it up. So Tim, how about if you take away, take us away with your first takeaways? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, things that I, I thought were really, really interesting. And Pat, this, this was a great, great conversation. First of all, the, the whole idea that as you're growing your, your data team, there's a lot to balance. You got to think about resources, about people, the skill sets, about budget. Uh, and you got to think about like what tools are already in place and what you can leverage, what you're going to bring that's new. So there's a lot to balance, a lot to think about. And ultimately, you want to drive towards success, right? Success is the point of the recipe, and you want to grow revenue, you want to lower costs, and especially the position that y'all are in at, uh, at, at your organization, you're thinking a lot about the revenue side, because that is the primary driver of what you're really focused on. And then, and then diversity, diversity of people, diversity of skill sets. I mean, all these things seem like they roll into what has to be your kind of master plan of how you grow your team. Yeah. And, and what about you, Juan? Juan, so I got a, I got a handful here. One is when you start, understand the lay of the land, right? Get to know the people. What are the existing workflows? Uh, don't kick down doors and start criticizing that you're doing this wrong, right? Just, you got to know the people, right? Uh, and one thing I really like is you really have to have people who understand the expertise and the tech stack of your domain, right? So again, if you're in marketing and, and Google Analytics or Adobe stack, like, you just don't need the data scientist, data engineer. You need somebody also who understands that tech stack for the particular domain. I think that, that that's a really interesting takeaway. And finally, and my most, my favorite one is be nice. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> create, cre create, create a safe environment, right? I, I love what you said. Attitudes are infectious and, and have that I've got your back atmosphere. Uh, and, and I mean, at the end of the day, forget about the data, the tech, just, just be a nice person. Be kind. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, you just, you, you have to be, it's, it, it, there's just, there's too many assholes out there to not be a nice guy, you know? And sometimes, yeah, you got to crack the whip a little bit. Little so bit. final, the final two questions, which is one is what's your advice? <laughs> Very broad. It's second. You provided some who, good ones already. <laughs> yeah. Who should, who should we invite next? I mean, not, I know, somebody specific or a particular area. So I would say if somebody should invite Max real quick, um, one of my buddies I worked really closely with uh, my last gig, his name is David Barsham Shaw. Um, he's a data scientist now with, I think he's in charge of data science for Edelman. Um, I'm happy to pass you his contact info. Very interesting guy. Um, I would recommend him. He's awesome. Um, and then in terms of advice, I think we'll do a 1A and 1B. 1A, don't be an asshole. It's automatic. Just don't be an asshole. Uh, but also get, get rest. I think that's the one thing I've learned throughout this process is like, I could work 24 seven and still not get everything done in a day. And in our world, like you just, you can't like, you can't just overwork yourself and try to fake it through a presentation, pretend you have energy. We're working with math, hardcore numbers, get rest, make sure your data is correct. If you show up tired every day, you're just going to burn yourself out. So don't be an asshole. Get your seat. So how do you build a great data team? Don't be an asshole and sleep. <laughs> That's pretty much it right there. I, I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Pat, so much. This is fantastic. Love it. Cheers, great having Thanks you. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah.